But these are strong supporters of the BDS movement. They are not honest brokers. We wouldn't afford a white nationalist organization the, uh, uh, the le leeway that Peter is giving this organization. Oh, they're not saints. This is an anti-Semitic a group that supported terrorism, supports blowing up innocent civilians and children. And no matter what you think of the uh, dispute between the Palestinians and uh, Israel, that is an illegitimate tactic that no one should associate with advocates of. You want a quick response to that, Peter? Then I want to bring sure. Hanan Shroy is actually very well known as a nonviolent activist, been a critic of the Palestinian Authority, one of the most important Palestinian feminists. There are many Palestinians who believe that Palestinians have the use, right to use mm -hmm. violence because of the daily violent oppression they feel. I disagree with them. I believe in only nonviolent protests. But the point is, every time any Palestinian leader or any Palestinian organization tries to expose what happens, this is exactly what happens. People what, try to discredit is... them because they don't want to talk about the real issue. The real issue is an absolutely indefensible denial of basic human rights. What's that have to do with supporting terrorism? I mean, it, no, no one has any problem with harshly criticizing Israel. That's fine. But you don't support blowing up innocent people. That's just a, a, a bottom line uh, no, of, uh, something of, we all should agree on. Of course not, but the on. purpose behind focusing on this is to try to distract attention from the reality on the ground, which is funded by American but would you, tax dollars. Our tax dollars this, blow up the homes of people who cannot get permits to build because they're non-citizens under military would law. Would this be your standard for a white nationalist organization? These oh, they are, just say... Not, Any moment now, we will hear from Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. They are together in Minnesota, about to speak after Israel banned their visit. We'll bring you their statements live. And while we wait for those comments, the president sending an outrageous, patently false tweet claiming that Google manipulated the 2016 election. All right, hang on one second. Pause on that. This is the Congresswoman Good Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. Sorry to be uh, late. There was some uh, traffic detours. Um, I'm so glad to be here with my sister Rashid today. Um, today we're here to highlight the before I actually start, we were supposed to have a couple of our, the other speakers. Are they in the room? Do you want to join yeah, us? Please come up. How are you? Thank you for coming. Thank you for everything you do. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you. Well, wonderful. Today we're here to highlight the human cost of the occupation and travel restrictions on Palestinians and others. As many of you know, I had planned to travel to Israel and Palestine to hear from individuals on the ground about the conflict so that I could be more informed as a member of Congress and as a member on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Contrary to many media reports, and the statements of the Israeli Prime Minister. I plan to meet directly with members of the Knesset and Israeli security, along with Palestinian civil society groups, former IDF soldiers, Israel, Palestine, and international organizations, and United Nations officials. Leading up to the trip, I met with constituents holding a wide range of views on the conflict. All the activities on my trip had been done by members had been done by members of Congress in the past, including a nearly identical trip a few years ago led by the very same Palestinian organization leading this trip. In addition to me and Rashida going on the trip, we were going to be joined by Stacy Plasquette from the Virgin Islands. The decision to ban me and my colleagues, the first, my colleague, the first two Muslim American women elected to Congress, is nothing less than an attempt by an ally of the United States to suppress our ability to do our jobs as elected officials. But this is not just about me. Netanyahu's decision to deny us entry might be unprecedented for members of Congress. But it is the policy of his government when it comes to Palestinians. This is the policy of his government when it comes to anyone who holds views that threaten the occupation. A policy that has been edged on and supported by Trump's administration. That's because the only way to preserve 
unjust policy is to suppress people's freedom of uh, expression, freedom of association, and freedom of movement. My colleague and I are not the only ones who are being denied the right to see for ourselves the reality on the ground on the West Bank. The Netanyahu government, for example, is currently trying to deport Omar Shakir, a human rights worker with Human Rights Watch, because he has reported on human rights conditions in the West Bank and Gaza. Last year, the Netanyahu government refused entry to American citizen Catherine Frank, Frank and my friend Vince Warren, who had arrived on a human rights mission. All of these actions have nothing to, do nothing to bring us closer to peace. In fact, they do the opposite. They maintain the occupation and prevent a solution to the conflict. Fortunately, we in the United States have a constructive role to play. We give Israel more than $3 million in aid every year. This is predicated on their being an important ally in the region and the only democracy in the Middle East. But denying visit to duly elected members of Congress is not consistent with being an ally and denying millions of people freedom of movement or expression or self-determination is not consistent with being a democracy. We must be asking, as Israel's ally, the Netanyahu government stop the expansion of settlements on Palestinian land and ensure full rights for Palestinians if we are to give them aid. These are not just my views. These are the views held by the range of experts, peace advocates on this issue. We know Donald Trump would love nothing more than to use this issue to pit Muslims and Jewish Americans against each other. The Muslim community and the Jewish community are being othered and made into the boogeyman by this administration. But, uh, but as we will hear today, people of, of all different faiths are coming together to speak up against the status quo in the region. I'm grateful for the solidarity shown by so many of my colleagues in Congress. I understand and appreciate the calls for members to avoid traveling to Israel until Rashida and I are allowed to go without condition. But it is my belief that as legislators, we have an obligation to see the reality there for ourselves. We have a responsibility to conduct oversight over our government's foreign policy and what happens with the millions of dollars we send in aid. So I would encourage my colleagues to visit, meet with the people we were going to meet with, see the things we were going to see, hear the stories we were going to hear. We cannot, we cannot let Trump and Netanyahu succeed in hiding the cruel reality of the occupation from us. So I call on all of you to go. The occupation is real, Bearing, barring members of Congress from seeing it does not make it go away. We must end it together. Now it's with honor that I introduce my sister Rashida Tlaib, who has been so brave and resilient and someone um, who has deep connections to the region uh, and someone who I would have loved to, met, to have met um, her city, Rashida Tlaib. Thank you so much to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, for inviting me to her district to join you all today. I am incredibly thankful for her leadership and strength through all uh, she has been dealing with uh, as a woman of color in Congress. I don't know how she does it sometimes, but the outpouring of support we have received from our constituents and supporters across the country shows us how important it is to keep fighting for justice. Today's, today, Reps Omar 
and Plasquette and I were supposed to be on a congressional trip and delegation to the Palestine and Israel. And such delegations are common occurrence for members of Congress. Earlier this month, in fact, 71 other members of Congress traveled to Israel seemingly without incident. What is not common occurrence is members of Congress being barred from entering a country on these fact-finding missions unless they agree to strict set of rules curtailing their rights or being required to submit their itineraries for stop-by-stop -stop pre-approval. History does have a habit of repeating itself. I learned this week that a former member of Congress, Congressman Charles C. Diggs, Jr., was denied entry into apartheid South Africa in 1972. He was also the representative for the 13th Congressional District in Michigan. I was born and raised in the beautiful Detroit, where many of my African-American teachers taught me about the realities of oppression and justice and the need to speak up and take action. Growing up in a city that has been at the center of many social justice movements for civil rights, labor rights, and equality, and absorbing those lessons has shaped who I am today and drives me to push for peace and justice for the Palestinian and Israeli people. As a young girl visiting Palestine to see my grandparents and extended family, I watched as my mother had to go through dehumanizing checkpoints. Even though she was a United States citizen and proud American, I was there when my city was in a terrible car accident and my cousins and I cried so she could have access to the best hospitals, which were in Jerusalem. I remember shaking with fear when checkpoints appeared in the small village of Beth Oral Foka, tanks and guns everywhere. I remember visiting East Jerusalem with my then husband and him escorting, escorted off the bus, although he was a United States citizen, just so security forces could harass him. All I can do as my city's granddaughter, as the, as the granddaughter of a woman who lives in occupied territory, is to elevate her voice by exposing the truth the only way I know how. As my Detroit public schools teachers taught me by humanizing the pain of oppression, our delegation trip included meetings with Israeli veterans who were forced to participate in military occupation. They also desperately want peace and self-determination for their Palestinian neighbors. They could have shed light into injustices of raids, shootings, demolitions, and child detention. The delegation would have seen firsthand why walls are destructive, not productive. They could have asked the people in Bethlehem how walls cut people off away from economic opportunities, from a way to live, and do psychological damage that lasts forever. All I can do as her granddaughter is help humanize her and the Palestinian people's plight. I know that when we can finally see them as deserving of human dignity, everyone who lives there will be able to live in peace. It is unfortunate that Prime Minister Netanyahu has apparently taken a page out of Trump's book and even direction from Trump to deny this opportunity. And yes, while folks are shocked that this happened to us, but today we will hear from folks who will help show the reality for many who have been barred from going to, into Israel not to be even able to reach the Palestinian people. They are fellow Americans who cannot visit their families or their loved ones. They should be deep, all of us should be deeply disturbed all of us Americans should be deeply disturbed. And with that, I then thank you so much uh, to my co uh, colleague, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, for helping humanize the Palestinian people. Thank you, Rashida. Um, <clears throat> next, we will hear from uh, Lana Berwaki, Palestinian American and a Minnesota resident who has never been able to return to her family's homeland of Palestine. Thank you, Ilhan. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you to Representatives Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib for inviting me to speak today. I was asked to share some of my personal story. I'm Lana Barkawi. I'm um, the daughter of Palestinian immigrants to this country. I live in Minneapolis with my husband and my two children. And although I am Palestinian, I have never been able to visit Palestine. 
My story is like that of so many people who live in the diaspora caused by the occupation of Palestine by Israel. Palestine is a home I have All right, seen. you've been listening to Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib uh, explain their side of how they refused entry into Israel by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu after President Trump pushed Netanyahu not to allow them in. Um, back here with the panel right now, Jess, let me just ask you first, what do they get from this, these two members of Congress, by publicizing this? This way today, I, I think that I think that they get their second best option. They wanted to go to Israel. I think they wanted to have this this trip, and they would much rather be coming back to share the information that they had gleaned from the various people that they were trying to meet. So I think this is this is definitely not a political win for them, and I don't think either one of them would characterize it that way. But it is really unusual that we get to hear the voices of Palestinian Americans in our political discourse. We have never had a Palestinian American in Congress. So the fact that we are able to have this conversation with these voices, with these messengers, who have this lived diversity of experience that we've simply never seen in leadership, I think that actually can't be overstated. We've had a very monolithic approach to the way we talk about Israel, which has been a, a really big challenge that has been faced globally, and America has a particular role in it. And we have done so in the absence of Palestinian Americans. So I, I think the, the upside to any of this, if there can be one, is that we get to have that conversation now. I want to go on the phone now to Oren Lieberman, our correspondent who is in Israel right now. And Oren, I'm glad we have you because those members of Congress had very severe criticism for the Israeli government and Prime Minister Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu. And they also said some things that were controversial, among other things they claimed they were going to meet with members of the Knesset. I know there's some dispute about whether, in fact, that is the case. What can you tell us about the Israeli government version here? Well, we haven't gotten a response yet from the Israeli government, but I suspect we'll start hearing one soon, if not from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu himself, who's currently on an official visit to Ukraine, and certainly some of the other members of his government. Uh, there were some reports here that they were going to meet with uh, a member of the Joint Arab List, certainly a member of Israel's Knesset uh, from that party. They were also going to meet with uh, PLO Executive Committee member Hadam Ashrawi, it's worth noting that it was Hadam Ashrawi's uh, organization, not as a political organization, but that organization that arranged the trip. So although the initial planning of the trip appeared to be civil service societies, um, non-government uh, NGOs, uh, as well as peace activists and human rights organizations, they were going to meet, um, at least had plans to meet, a Knesset member from Israel, as well as a, a PLO politician in Hadam Ashrawi. All right, Oren, stand by for a second. Back here with Peter Beiner. Peter, that organization that he's talking about is called MIFTA, which is an organization that in the past has published articles on their website using phrases like blood libel, which in the past on their website has praised Palestinians who've carried out attacks against Israelis. And this was the organization that was involved with the planning of that trip. Now, you heard Ilhan Omar refer to that obliquely in her statement, but is that a type of organization that you should be connected with as a U.S. member of Congress? Palestinians don't have to be saints in order to deserve the basic rights that all of us take for granted, right? MIFTA has said things that I disagree with. They made an anti-Semitic statement that they apologized for. The point is, when you go there, I say this as an American Jew. My children go to Jewish day school. I lead services in an Orthodox synagogue. Judaism at the center of my life. The first time I went to spend time with Palestinians in the West Bank, it was a shattering experience. The only thing I could imagine would be similar for Americans would be going to visit the Jim Crow South. When you see people living under the control of the state with no rights, they cannot become citizens. They cannot vote for the control for the state that controls their lives. They do not have free movement. They need a pass to move from city to city. They live under a military legal system. The consequences are more brutal than we can imagine sitting here. So do I agree with MIFTA? Of course not. I had a close friend who was killed in a suicide bombing. But Palestinians don't, you could have made the same argument if you went to visit SNCC and said, oh, they were connected with communists. Some of their people have made anti-white statements. The point is, what Ilhan Omar said is the, tr is the most important point. People need to go and see for themselves. I've never seen anyone who's gone and seen for themselves and not been transformed by the experience. I, that, I think, is true and apolitical, that it is worth going to Israel, worth going to the West Bank so you can see for yourself. You get a real sense of the situation on the ground. Rich Lowry. On the subject of MIFTA, the other side of that is that there has been a congressional trip that was led by MIFTA before, and the Israeli government let it happen. Now, I know it was before the actual law was right. passed, but they didn't need a law to keep people out if they didn't want to, but they allowed it to happen before. Now they're not, 
in claiming it's because of this organization. Yeah, well, obviously the proximate cause here was the Trump tweet, which highlighted this and made it a major issue. But there is a law that allows Israel to ban foreigners who support the BDS movement to isolate uh, and delegitimize Israel. It's been not applied against members of Congress before. It's been applied against EU politicians. But these are strong supporters of the BDS movement. They are not honest brokers. We wouldn't afford a white nationalist organization the, uh, uh, the le leeway that Peter is giving this organization. Oh, they're not saints. This is an anti-Semitic a group that supported terrorism, supports blowing up innocent civilians and children. And no matter what you think of the uh, dispute between the Palestinians and uh, Israel, that is an illegitimate tactic that no one should associate with advocates of. You want a quick response to that, Peter? Then I want to bring sure. Hanan Shroy is actually very well known as a nonviolent activist, been a critic of the Palestinian Authority, one of the most important Palestinian feminists. There are many Palestinians who believe that Palestinians have the use, right to use mm -hmm. violence because of the daily violent oppression they feel. I disagree with them. I believe in only nonviolent protests. But the point is, every time any Palestinian leader or any Palestinian organization tries to expose what happens, this is exactly what happens. People what, try to discredit is... them because they don't want to talk about the real issue. The real issue is an absolutely indefensible denial of basic human rights. What's that have to do with supporting terrorism? I mean, it, no, no one has any problem with harshly criticizing Israel. That's fine. But you don't support blowing up innocent people. That's just a, a, a bottom line uh, no, uh, of, uh, something of, we all of should agree not, but on. The purpose behind f focusing on this is to try to distract attention from the reality on the ground, which is funded by American would you, tax dollars. Our tax dollars this, blow up the homes of people who cannot get permits to build because they're non-citizens under military so law. Would this be your standard for white nationalist organizations? Oh, they just say, not, they say some Hanana, racist I, I, things. No, Hanana, they I'm support sorry, some sorry, terrorism. Sorry, with all due respect, that's okay. you have You're not been there me. and seen this on the ground. I, I know but, Hanana Shrawi. She is nothing close to a white nationalist. She is someone seeking but so, freedom but then from why does the organization, people. Why does the organization publish things supporting terrorism? Rich, I disagree with violent resistance. No, but why, why but do they... It is because, because a lot of Palestinians believe that because they are subject to daily violence of a system which denies them basic rights, they have the right to respond violently. I disagree with them. But an African-American who supported violence against the United States under slavery or Jim Crow, that did not excuse their denial of basic rights because I disagree with the tactic they were using to resist it. I mean, it's, again, it's fine to harshly criticize Israel and the occupation, but I don't think anyone's be associated with a group that supports... Terrorism, and this isn't black or white. I mean, they publish this stuff. No one's many, forcing many them to publish this stuff. Many, years ago, there were certain you, statements again, you on would their not... website. Hanan Ashrawi has devoted her life as a nonviolent activist to opposing an oppression which none of us doesn't do, which does not accord with the values that any of us believe in as Americans. So she doesn't control her own organization and what it publishes? Rich, why don't you try spending a little bit of time focusing on the fact that almost $4 billion of U.S. aid is used to put children you're in the detention. One, you're, you're the one distracting right. from the issue. I'm asking you No, 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 you, this I'm is the issue. You're distracting you're from the issue because and, uh, National Review, just, shouting just, and just one as one National time, Review defended apartheid, and just as you defended segregation, yeah, yeah. you now defend Israel's oppression of Palestinian basic rights. I it's do, a tradition for you guys. Look, and if an organization supports terrorism, that organization should be on, be on the pale. And when I don't, Palestinians I don't see why protest nonviolently, when they protest nonviolently, okay. right, so you, so you discredit saying, them as well. So you're saying that, in some sense, justifies terrorism? Of course it doesn't justify their, what they I've want said again and again, I disagree with terrorism. What I'm saying is you're trying to distract from the real issue. The real issue is American complicity in the denial of basic Palestinians. All right, we're going to leave this, guys. What's the content of your opposition mean we're gonna if you leave won't this condemn there. this organization? Rich, please go there yourself. We're going to leave that there. Rich, Peter, guys, stand by. Much more ahead, including a look at Trump, President Trump's patently false tweet about the 2016 election. Stick around.